Miami, though, at this point, still a little bit of an unknown as far as strength of record is concerned. Now, as you guys have watched, I love what they're capable of, but the close calls do have my antenna raised just a little bit. Hello and welcome. It is always college football. It is the October 7th edition of ACF. I'm your host, Greg McElroy, and we appreciate all of you that have tuned into the show in the first seven weeks of the college football season. How are we in week seven? But here we are, and we appreciate you guys that have come via the podcast. We also have seen all of you that have responded with outstanding ratings and reviews. We are grateful to you for that on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. If you could take two seconds, check and make sure. Are you subscribed? Have you rated? If you feel like writing a review, we would much appreciate that. That'd be amazing. And of course, to those of you on the ESPN YouTube channel, I've been actually reading the comments. I don't engage a whole lot on the comments, but I've been reading because I want to get feedback from y'all. So I appreciate those of you that tell us how dumb we are, those of you that tell us how great we are. Any of those opinions are fine. As long as you lie somewhere in between, the polarization of the show is supposed to be fun. Look, today... For those that are new, it's our Monday takeaway show. We take 10 things that we learned from the weekend and we dive just a touch deeper. And there's a bunch to take away from this past weekend with all the chaos and the excitement that the season provided us. So let's not waste any time. Let's dive in the 10 things we learned from week six of the college football season. Takeaway number one. Saturday was historically awesome. Just so we can go through the line items of how wild this day was, it was the first time five of the AP top 11 lost on the same day since 2016. I actually remember that day, by the way. I remember that day vividly. It was my first year calling games at ESPN, and I remember that day thinking like, oh gosh, it's going to be a dog day. There's no good games. And then sure enough, Bunch of chaos ensues, and that's when I always realize, like on the weekends, you don't think a whole lot's going to happen. That's when a lot of craziness actually goes down. This was also the first day multiple AP top five SEC teams lost against unranked opponents. Alabama, Tennessee, and Missouri. It's the third time a single conference had three teams ranked inside the AP top 10, and then they lose in the same day. That's in the poll era. So dating all the way back to 1936, the SEC also uh, had multiple teams lose on October 7th, 2006. That was Auburn, Georgia, and LSU. And the Big Ten had three teams lose on September 10th, 2005. So a uniquely significant day as far as upsets are concerned. Four of the AP top 11 lost against unranked teams. Okay, <laughs> tied for the second most on the single day all time. Five of the top 11 lost to unranked teams back in 2016. And think about how close we came to having six of the top 11 because Miami, near certain defeat, I mean, down 25 in the second half, they rally and ultimately beat Cal, but it was wild. Here's what I find interesting about this. And I know, look, we have all had opinions about playoff expansion. Some support it, some don't support it. I, for the longest time, have not supported it, but. Now that it's here, I got no choice, so I'm on board. But my concern has always been, would it have an effect on how people reacted to the do or die nature of college football? That's who we are. You lose, you're in trouble. You lose twice, you're out. Well, what I've noticed, and while it is reassuring for fan bases like Tennessee and Alabama, and Georgia last week, and LSU after week one, and Clemson after week one, and all the teams that have experienced defeat. And there's a bunch, right? There's not that many undefeateds left. All the teams that have experienced defeat, it is reassuring to know that, hey, I'm still alive. I'm still alive, guys. My season's not over. I can still win my conference. I can still get to the playoff. I can still get to the national championship. I can still win the national championship. Even teams that have lost twice, USC losing the second time this weekend, they're still alive. Do they need help? Perhaps. Do they need to get things sorted out? Yes, we'll talk about that in a minute. But they're alive. So that is encouraging. 
But what I'd also say is that for many fan bases that saw their team lose in unexpected fashion this past weekend, it still feels like the sky is falling, okay? People are still losing their minds. So even though the ramifications of a defeat are not as significant as they once were, the reaction to a defeat is still as harsh and as intense as any sport you'll find, especially in the regular season. So that's a long roundabout way of saying we're still really healthy in our sport. And we might have more parity in the sport than ever before based on what we saw this past weekend. Let's go to takeaway number two. Alabama ran into a buzzsaw, but their defense has work to do. Okay, Alabama's defense against Georgia the week before, sitting there early in the second quarter, they're up 28-0, and from that point forward, from that moment, really since they forced the safety against Carson Beck, since they forced the safety there in the second quarter to give them a 30-7 to lead over Georgia, it just hasn't been the same. They've had a difficult time getting off the field. Fourth down conversions were a huge problem against Georgia. Third down and fourth down conversions were a huge problem against Vandy. The biggest stats in this game, it's pretty simple. One, Vandy had 75 offensive snaps. 75. Alabama had just 45. That is is significant, especially when taking into account Alabama in the second half alone against Georgia had to defend 55 offensive snaps. So the last six quarters, Alabama has had to defend 130 snaps. That's a lot. You look at the time of possession, also a pivotal stat in this one. The Doors had the ball for 42 plus minutes. Quick math would tell you that means Bama had the ball under 18. That's significant in this one. Others of significance that are always a thing, turnovers, okay? Bama had two, Vandy had none. Those two turnovers turned into 13 points for the doors. Now we can look back at the offense and say, I, I think the offense for Bama played pretty well. 17 minutes and 35 points, I feel like that's pretty good. 45 snaps, 35 points. You're averaging about more than three quarters of a point per snap. That's pretty good. Granted, yeah, have the tip ball interception that goes to the house, disappointing. Have the fumble where you don't see a guy coming off the right side, also disappointing. But for the most part, if we're summing up the performance for the Tide, the offense did their job. You'd like to see him maybe run the ball a little bit more. That'd be awesome. But at the same time, the circumstances of the game really didn't allow for it. They didn't have enough offensive snaps, and they were in a pretty significant hole for most of the game. I mean, Vandy led wire to wire in this one, so it wasn't a game in which you would really be able to hand it off with a lot of regularity. The problems for Bama right now lie on the defensive side. Here's what I'm concerned about. The fact that Vandy ran the ball 53 times for 167 yards. Uh, the fact that Diego Pavia ran 20 times for 56, but four of those 20 carries extended the drive. I think you also have to be concerned about how efficient he was. And then more importantly, on critical down and distance. You ask any coach, third down, red zone. That's where games are won and lost. If you can force field goals in the red zone, you're cooking with gas. If you can get off the field on third down, you're in great shape. Look at all the great defenses in the sport. Look at their third down numbers. The ones that are the best are usually among the best on third down as well. Well, Vandy went 12 of 18 on third down. Alabama had allowed 11 total third down conversions in the past four games. And five of those conversions that Vandy had were on the ground. Vandy ran it eight times for 42 yards on third down. That is of concern. And then when you get the run game going, then guess what? Diego Pavia can drop back, hit some throws downfield, which he did 
very, very impressively, I might add, averaging nearly 16 yards of completion. He had his first five passes, finished the game by going 10 of 11 in the second half for a buck 56. They didn't sack Diego Pavia, and they recorded just seven total pressures. They also had some self-inflicted mistakes. They had a couple penalties that kept drives alive. They had the double number, which was an issue, extended the drive again. Alabama's got a lot to clean up, but I think the biggest thing is when you're playing against a triple option offense, which that's kind of, they're not your traditional Navy Army triple option, but it's an offense that is rooted in triple option principles. You got to play your keys. Alabama didn't do that very well, and Vandy did a masterful job of executing. Shovel passes, jet sweeps, motions, hitting it on the motion, misdirection, opportunistic play calling on fourth and short, hitting at for a touchdown, winning some one-on-ones. Vandy was just the better team, which is why Bama ran into a buzzsaw. But there's a lot to clean up for the Tide as they move forward if they still have SEC and national championship aspirations. Takeaway number three. Tennessee's offense is a bit of a crossroads. Doesn't mean they can't still get things going and become a super elite group, but they're at a bit of an issue right now, and that's okay. Let's start with Arkansas because it was awesome. Awesome with how they controlled the first half, long, sustained drives. Uh, But they also had a bunch of really nice drives and didn't have a lot to show for it. (laughs) Arkansas was able to get inside of Tennessee's 25 yard line multiple times in the first half, but they went to halftime with just a three nothing lead. After each of the first three drives, Tennessee had three drives, Arkansas had three drives, Arkansas had run 35 plays, Tennessee had run just 14. Part of that is because There wasn't a lot of rhythm on offense, and Tennessee's defense, I didn't think, played as well as they're capable of playing. Let's start with the quarterback, though, because that's where a lot of this is going to kind of come from. Right now, let's just acknowledge what it is. The best part of Tennessee's offense is running back Dylan Sampson. All right, you look at how he played coming out of halftime, 22 carries. He went from like 15 yards rushing to 110 in about two minutes, it felt like. So he got things going, but the offense is really going to run through him at this point. I wanted, you wanted, everyone wants Nico Iamaleava to be a superstar day one. We all want that. But that's just not reality right now. He's still a young quarterback, and there was some things that he left on the field, and it was probably his worst performance, but that's okay. He's a freshman. Didn't see the field really well. I felt like he got affected by the pressure. Uh, I didn't think the protection was very good many of the times. There were several times in which they had multiple guys protection. They were getting beat by a four-man rush. So that's a problem. And then there were some misses. There were some misses and a couple of throws that you absolutely have to make. And then people will point to the final play of the game. That's just situational awareness. But that's that's To expect a guy just five starts into his career, six starts into his career, to have that totally buttoned up is expecting an awful lot. You'd love to throw it up and give a guy a chance. It just is what it is. It's a real teachable moment, though, for him. But the big play potential of this offense is going to be really the catalyst to them becoming the best that they can be. And when you have a game in which you manage just one completion that goes for 20-plus yards and you drop back and throw it 29 times, that's not going to be good enough. Now, Tennessee is getting the big boy, tendency-breaking defensive plans, which, by the way, should be received as a compliment. I've watched Arkansas's defense for a while. There were some alignment things that they did defensively that were not on tape in the games prior. There were some things that they put in specifically for this game that clearly caught Tennessee off guard. That's what happens when you're a great team. Teams are going to look at you and say, well, if we just line up and play the way we've played up to this point, they're going to run right through us. (laughs) That's, I think, a tip of the cap from Travis Williams, the defensive coordinator at Arkansas, saying we can't do what we've done against these guys. We have to change. We have to adjust tendencies and we have to create confusion. The offensive line, I thought, struggled as a result. They had four false starts. They had an illegal snap. They had to delay a game. 
there were just challenges there for Tennessee that we have not envisioned. But this offense, a bit of a crossroads right now. they got to get Nico playing better. He's got to be more accurate down the field. And then to continue to feed Dylan Sampson because that is going to be their ticket to the top of the sport, running the football between the tackles with a super talented running back. Takeaway number four. People love this coast-to-coast -coast conference stuff. Okay, when we have the ACC and you have Cal and Stanford and then Miami has to go at night and play ACC after dark against Cal. Like I kind of enjoy the coast to coast conference stuff. I love that I'm watching Big 12 at one o'clock in the morning when Texas Tech is playing Arizona. I love it. It's awesome. Do we not all agree that it's super fun to see teams that are outside their comfort zone playing in some cases three time zones away? in games of significance within the league. I love it. I'm always going to be a little skeptical about how what kind of toll it takes on the players. I'm always going to be worrisome about the toll it takes on the team because here we are, we're in the business of trying to prognosticate and explain, and there are just some things that are tough to explain. But when we have now watched the Big Ten in particular, all right, we'll start there. Really, we'll start and finish there because they're the ones we're paying closest attention to. This new coast-to-coast -coast Big Ten has now had nine conference games featuring pairs of schools, a pair of schools, that are at least two time zones apart. The visiting teams in those games are one and eight. USC has been on the wrong end of multiple losses like that. They lost to Minnesota this past weekend and Michigan a couple weeks ago. We have now seen Michigan go to Washington, a couple time zones, loss. We have more of those coming up, by the way. Penn State heads to SC, Ohio State heads to Oregon. Well, one and nine for road teams in these coast-to-coast -coast travel games. It's something to watch. And we're in, we're in October. We're in early October. You're not feeling the fatigue and the monotony of the season just yet. Talk to me in November, early November, when not only is time zone challenges a factor, but you also have to potentially play in weather. I mean, it's going to get real interesting in a hurry. I'll just tell you, look, I played in the AFC East with the New York Jets for a couple of years. Uh, played with the Cincinnati Bengals, which also Eastern time zone. And we had to travel to Oakland, to Seattle, to San Diego. And even as professional athletes, it's extremely challenging. Imagine having to also compartmentalize not just the travel, but taking care of your body, getting the rest necessary sleep, making sure you're eating right when you're on the road, making sure that you are practicing good habits when you're on the road. And you've never done this and you're expected to play at a high level in a hostile environment. That's going to be really tough. It's hard on professionals. Imagine what it's like for the 19-year-old kid that's going on the road for the very first time. Just something to monitor. This could be a theme that continues as we move forward in the season. Takeaway number five. I just referenced them a moment ago. Where does USC go from here? Now, I've actually have said, and I told you on Thursday show, I, I really like SC. I think they're I think they're really good. And I, I think back to how things have gone. Are they a play or two here or there away from, from being undefeated? Absolutely. You make a tackle against Khalil Mullings when you have him bodied up on a big run, you win the game. You look at this past weekend. You have better protection on the right side, doesn't lead to the interception. You might win the game. But just to keep things in perspective, okay? The record for some of these coaches in their last 12 games, and this is a tweet from Brett McMurphy, so we will borrow it from him. Sonny Dykes, since getting to the national championship, it's been kind of a mixed bag, frankly, for TCU, right? They're five and seven in their last 12 games. Hugh Freeze at Auburn five and seven. Billy Napier 
who's on the hot seat. Everyone acknowledges this, even though he had a nice win this past weekend, five and seven. Sam Pittman, huge win this weekend for Arkansas, but Sam Pittman's got work to do. If we know for certain that he's going to be back in Fayetteville next year, he's five and seven, which brings us to Lincoln Riley, who in his last 12 games is also five and seven. Now, the question about USC and Lincoln Riley has always been has always been about how will his teams play along both lines of scrimmage. That's always been the question, and I think it's a fair critique given how his teams played at the end of his tenure at Oklahoma and at the beginning of his tenure at USC. Now, you can easily point to Alex Grinch, the defensive coordinator, make him the scapegoat. 100% fair. The team played out of position. They were not disciplined. They did a lot of things I didn't align with defensively. They made a necessary change, and the results from the Danton Lynn hire have been significantly better until this past weekend. Because even against the Michigan rushing attack, that was the first game with Alex Orgy as the starting quarterback. That was a desperation game for Michigan. They couldn't start the season two and two on their home field. It just couldn't happen. They didn't handle it well as the game went along, but for the most part, I came out of that thinking, man, SC is better along the defensive front than they were last year. Even though they just gave up a million yards on the ground, and just gave up a two-minute drill in which Michigan didn't even throw the ball to win the game. But then we fast forward to this weekend, I see Minnesota rush for nearly 200. This is a group that has not fared very well in the beginning of the season. First four games, they averaged just over 100 rushing yards a game. And they're playing teams like North Carolina, who is not necessarily known for their stinginess defensively. Minnesota's quarterback, very efficient. Mac Frostman, really efficient. 15 to 19, 169, added three touchdowns on the ground. Their tailback, Darius Taylor, goes 25 for 144. The other side of the ball, SC ran the ball really well, really well. But the problem is pass protection, I think, at times, has been a little dicey. You look at the performance against Michigan a couple weeks ago, and you're able to point to the Michigan game and say, that's Michigan. They got dudes up front defensively, right? These guys are great. So allowing 21 pressures and six quarterback hits and four sacks against Michigan, we came away from that saying Michigan is just that good on that side of the ball. And they, I still think they are. I think Michigan's very, very good along the defensive line. But then we fast forward to this past weekend. SC's sitting there with a seven-point lead, chance to kind of wear things down, 10 minutes to go, third and five at Minnesota's 30-yard line. You get beat on the right side, hits Miller Moss, ball floats up into the air, and it's intercepted. Minnesota then goes on to score 14 unanswered points to swipe the victory. So pass protection is something that clearly needs to improve or needs to get more consistent if SC is going to make some noise and get back to within the playoff picture. Because guess what? They're against the ropes. There's probably not a situation where they can lose more than one more down the stretch and still make the playoffs. And guess who's coming to town this weekend? That'd be Penn State, the team that I think is one of the best in the sport. They're allowing 11 points a game and had seven sacks the last time we saw them against really high-level Big Ten competition in Illinois. So. They better get better, and they better get better in a hurry if you are USC, knowing what's coming up next week. Takeaway number six, what was Ohio State's Achilles heel might actually be a strength. I know you're sitting there thinking this is an upside down world, but let's just be real for a minute. The last couple of years with Ohio State, what was their biggest issue? It was their offensive line and how inconsistent that group occasionally was. They were not a group that was physically imposing. They had somewhat talented guys, but they were not a group that really scared you to death. You felt like, hey, we might be able to neutralize that talent advantage that Ohio State has if we just take it to them in the trenches. People have labeled Ohio State as, quote, soft. I think that's ridiculous. I've watched Ohio State for years. I've known Ryan Day for years. They are not a soft program. 
just because they have talented weapons and their superstars are their wide receivers doesn't mean that this is a group that isn't super physical. Because I saw them with my own eyes in the building on the call go toe-to-toe against the 2022 Georgia Bulldogs and give them all they want and matched their toughness and matched their physicality. So I have never thought that this Ohio State program wasn't a physical group. But I will tell you this. I've always thought their offensive line, well, always is a bit of a stretch. I've thought their offensive line in recent years wasn't nearly as good as the rest of their team. Just just being honest. And when you watch them against Michigan, it was painfully obvious. When, when you watched them against Missouri, it was pretty obvious as well. Well, guess what? They just played Iowa. And this is the first super respectable opponents that Ohio, that Ohio State has faced this year, in my opinion. Some people say, well, Michigan State. No, to me, I think Michigan State is playing kind of with one arm tied behind their back because of the inconsistency they have with turnovers right now. But I look at where Ohio State is. To hold a resurgent Iowa offense to just seven points, to watch their defense play as well as they did and to own the line of scrimmage offensively made me feel really, really good. Let's just talk quickly about this offensive line. They just ran for 200 plus yards against Iowa. Guys, Iowa, if there's one thing Iowa does remarkably well for as long as I can remember, it's be stout against the run. Well, the Buckeyes just ran for 200. They are the first team to go over 100 yards on the ground against Iowa, and they averaged over five yards per carry. Iowa coming into this matchup had given up under two and a half yards per carry. Ohio State also only had two tackles made behind their own line of scrimmage. That's amazing. On the other side, they had nine tackles for loss. And people will point to, well, Iowa's offense is inept. Guys, Iowa's offense had been showing signs of life the last couple weeks. Like, K.J. Johnson had been getting things going a little bit for this Iowa group. He had come in averaging a bunch of yards per carry, a bunch of yards on the ground, and Ohio State dominated along the line of scrimmage. So I am super excited about what I've seen from Ohio State now. Because while I might not know with 100% certainty that they are drastically improved along the offensive line until this week because they will have a stout challenge against Oregon this week, I don't know if Oregon's defensive line is as capable as, say, Penn State's that they'll see in a few weeks. But I do think Oregon's defensive line is athletic and can create some problems for Ohio State. So I will be really interested in seeing how this matchup unfolds. But I'm starting to think that what was once a huge concern for Ryan Day and his program might be a strength now. The rushing attack, the balance, the offensive line play looks really solid through the first five or six games of the season for the Buckeyes. Takeaway number seven. If you have three quarterbacks, you have none. I'm sorry, Michigan. I'm sorry. And it's a bummer, too, because this has been a program that has been as stable and as predictable as you could possibly find in the sport the last three years. It culminated with a national championship victory in Houston. But everything about Michigan felt rock solid. Foundationally, where they were since 2021, all the way through, you just knew what you were going to get. Well, in comes 2024, and it's been anything but certain at the most important position. And while everyone is going to point to the quarterbacks, and we we will too, there's a lot more going on here at Michigan that is leading to their ineptitudes. I look at the offensive line. Let's be real. It's been a little inconsistent. I look at their wide receivers. There's not a receiver that they have that scares me to death right now. 
There's not a receiver that they have that I think to myself, like, oh man, I cannot leave that guy single covered because if I have him in single coverage, we got huge issues. There's not a guy like that. And with how they were built to play, the second they get in a hole and the other team starts fast and jumps on them early, how can Michigan respond? Well, there they are. They're down 14 nothing. And Michigan now goes into quarterback number three on the season, Jack Tuttle, who was finally cleared to practice a couple weeks ago. He'd been dealing with shoulder and elbow injuries that started last season, went all the way through the offseason. As a result, he was never really available to be a part of the quarterback competition. So it's circumstantial and challenging, but it's just a bummer. Because based on how he played Saturday, I think, Jack Tuttle would have won the competition had he been healthy. Now, he he didn't play like ridiculously good. He was 10 of 18, uh, had a touchdown, had an interception, but it was notably better than what we've seen from that position up to this point. And when you listen to Sharon Moore after the game, he's focusing on the positives from Tuttle's performance and really listening to him, trying to read between the lines. I'd be surprised if it's not Tuttle moving forward. But there's a lot of uncertainty because if you look at Tuttle, he's 25 years old. He's been a journeyman. I mean, we're talking about a guy that was playing as a backup to Michael Penix back at Indiana. But it looks like right now, they're moving in the right direction with him as the guy, but it's unfortunate they've now missed the better part of four, five, six, seven weeks because the guy that should have been the guy from the get-go was not available because he wasn't healthy. So here's hoping that moving forward, Michigan doesn't have to play this quarterback carousel anymore because it's a killer. You're trying to rally the team around Davis Warren. He's got turnover, Gene. Can't seem to... Can't seem to avoid making a critical error. Well, can't have that. We can't put ourselves in difficult spots by turning the ball over. Let's go with a guy that we can at least control the run game. He won't make bad decisions. And then maybe we keep him honest with the throw every once in a while. Well, in goes Orgy. They're entirely too one-dimensional. You can't beat high-level teams like that. So we got to pull the plug there because we're down 14 nothing on the road in Michigan really hasn't at this point felt great about their passing attack. And Washington's fans are about to come unglued because they are so fired up with the way their team started. In goes Tuttle, and it just feels like too little too late to salvage the season for Michigan, whereas it might have looked very different if Tuttle had been available all off season. Takeaway number eight. I thought the ACC was going to be really cut and dry. But it's starting to give me the feeling that this thing might be a little more dramatic than I anticipated. And part of that is exciting. Part of that leaves me feeling really uncertain. But let's go through the standings just for a minute, right? Let's look at the ACC standings. I have them right here sitting in front of me. Clemson's undefeated. Miami's undefeated. When I say cut and dry, that's what I kind of thought it was going to look like. Now, I thought Florida State would be better. But who didn't? <laughs> so I look at the top. I thought there'd be two, maybe three teams that would separate. I just thought those two or three teams would be Miami, one, Florida State, two, Clemson, three. That's kind of how I thought it'd go. And I thought the game between Clemson and Florida State this past weekend would have been the game that might determine who plays Miami in the ACC title game. It was in Tallahassee. I, led, I leaned a little Florida State there as a result. Boy, were we wrong about FSU. They are out, right? So, by a process of elimination, it's got to be Clemson, right? And it might very well be. When we fast forward to the end of the year, it might be Miami. It might be Clemson. And they might be going toe-to-toe -to -toe for the ACC championship and one of the top four seeds in victory, right? One of the top four seeds in the college football playoff. Miami's got flaws. No doubt about it. This is now two weeks in a row in which they've had to survive. Uh, the comeback bid this past weekend was nothing short of spectacular, but they were aided, I thought, 
by a critical no call on a targeting that should have been called and would have put the game on ice. And then the week before they survived by way of review. I thought it was incomplete as well, but they're playing on very thin ice right now. <laughs> they need to be better. They need to be more consistent on both sides of the ball. The offense can get them out of a jam, thank goodness. And they've showed toughness and guts, but the performance on the defensive side has left something to be desired. Clemson's been a juggernaut the last few weeks. I would expect that to continue. But entering the conversation now, SMU. Now, I thought it would take a little while for SMU to get to the point where they could play up to the level of Power 5 conference competition on a weekly basis. Because I look at SMU and I look at their schedule last year. Yeah, they won 11 games. Guys, SMU won 11 games last year, but you know what their record was against the Power 5? 0-3. Including a loss to Boston College, who was, at best, a middle-of-the-road ACC team. So I thought, man, SMU is going to chat. going to going to have some struggles. And then we watched them play against BYU, and I'm sitting there thinking, yep, yeah, you know what? SMU's, they're, they're flawed. Like, the line of scrimmage is going to be an issue. Well, that hasn't been the case these last couple of weeks. They make the switch to Kevin Jennings. He goes on the road to Louisville, and he's always been good running the football. He goes again for 113 and score on 10 carries. But I hadn't seen him throw it like that. If he throws it like that, look out, ACC. SMU might be a huge problem for you. And then how about Pitt, who's sitting there at 3-9 and nine last year, Things are looking really muddy for Pat Narduzzi. He goes out, he evaluates the entire world offensively. He lands on 31-year-old offensive coordinator Cade Bell, formerly of Western Carolina, hires him, goes and gets Eli Holstein, who transfers in from Alabama in January. And he's the first pit quarterback to win his first five starts since a guy named Dan Marino did it back in 1979. Uh, Holstein this past weekend, 25 of 42, 381, three touchdowns and a pick against North Carolina. So we look at the ACC. You got five undefeateds, Pitt, SMU, Miami, and Clemson, including a surprise undefeated in Virginia, but I don't know if that's as sustainable with what the Wahoos are doing. Louisville now has a loss and a head-to-head -head loss at that against SMU. And the rest of the league, it does feel like there could be some cannibalization. But what I thought was going to be a two-team race now might be a four-team race, given the way SMU and Pitt are playing on both sides of the ball. Let's get to takeaway number nine and our weekly group of five check-in. So, is there a better story right now in the sport than what's going on with Army and Navy? Because right now, Army is rolling in the American Athletic Conference. It's their first year in the AAC. And Navy is sitting there at undefeated as well. This Army-Navy game that's going to be played at the end of the year, by the way, uh, it's the week after conference championship games, like it always is. And it will be set after the college football playoff field is announced. But there's a chance that these two teams could be playing in the AAC championship. Both Army and Navy are sitting there combined 10-0. Army is 4-0 in conference play. They have a half-game lead over everyone else in the AAC, including Navy, who's 3-0. So both, both service academies still have to play Notre Dame, and both games are going to be really tough, <laughs> naturally. But if you're wondering right now, there could be a scenario, and just wrap your head around this, because this is mind-blowing there could be a scenario in which army and navy play each other in the aac championship the winner might go to the college football playoff because you got to win the aac if you want to get to the college football playoff so the winner might very well be able to do that they might then play the following week in the army navy game on its traditional standalone saturday they might play that day with not a whole lot on the line for the team that won the previous meeting. Thus, they might strongly consider 
resting their starters against their biggest rival because the following week after that, they'll be playing in the college football playoff. So just telling you, crazier things have happened and we are looking at a collision course where the service academies might be well positioned to get to the postseason for the very first time. Really hoping it happens too, by the way. It'd be incredible. It'd be a great story. And man, go America. Amazing. Boise State though, saying, hey, don't forget about us. Don't forget about Boise. We still got the Smurf turf out here in Boise. The passing game, maybe starting to click a little bit. The defense, <laughs> challenges on that side of the ball. Uh, the secondary is having some problems. It hasn't been very good, but they're still a pretty dominant group with what they have offensively. Ashton Genty is just flat out incredible. I don't know how else to describe it. He is just as electric and as exciting as you'll find in the sport. Uh, nearly 200 yards and three touchdowns. Again, the guy just does it every week. He's on pace for like 2,700 rushing yards. And if he gets there and he beats Barry Sanders' record, he's gonna likely win the Heisman Trophy. So gonna be fascinating to continue watching Boise and monitoring the G5 moving forward because remember, the winner of the G5 this year will be playing in the 12-team playoff. Takeaway number 10, this has become a practice for us every week. I don't love doing it, by the way, but I just think it's important because the AP poll and the coaches poll are okay. They have people do their best. I don't know how much time the coaches are putting into it. And the AP, there's just different philosophies. Like some people look at bad losses. Some people look at great wins. Some people look at the eye test. Some people look at the resume. I like kind of use a combination of all those to put my list together. But just so you know, I don't really quantify bad losses that much because I constantly hear that bad loss, bad loss. But Notre Dame has a bad loss. Alabama has a bad loss. Tennessee has a bad loss. Like to me, all losses are bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I don't view one loss as being better than the other loss. Like Georgia losing to Bama, people would say that's not a bad loss. It's a good loss. There's no good losses. <laughs> all losses are bad. So let's get out of like the moral victory world, okay? All losses are bad. Good losses versus bad losses are all bad. And good wins, I think, however, can certainly still vault you up regardless of what happens throughout the rest of the season. So let's go through it. Texas is number one. Uh, they have a good win and a convincing win over the Michigan Wolverines. Now, will that win hold up for Texas? You know, Texas has plenty of meat on the bone. They still have Oklahoma. They still have Georgia. So they still have AM, which is looking like it's going to be more and more of a challenge to beat moving forward, especially at their place at the end of the year. So Texas still has plenty of meat on the bone. And the win against Michigan might not hold up. Michigan might fall flat and finish eight and four, seven and five. But as of this moment, I still think going on the road to Ann Arbor and dominating the way they dominated is a really good performance. Let's go to number two, Ohio State. A little bit on eye test here. Just a little bit. And you know, I don't love to use eye test all the time. I just don't love it. it feels like kind of have to, though. I mean, we are now six weeks into the season, and it's not Ohio State's fault that Michigan State and Iowa are not super elite. It's not. I think Iowa's pretty good. I think Iowa's improved from where they were a year ago. I don't know if their defense is quite as good, but I still think Iowa's a rock-solid win, which is why I have Ohio State sitting at number two. Number three, it's Penn State. A little different from how the AP has it. They have a good win. I think they have a suffocating defense. For those that'll gravitate towards the low-hanging fruit that was the Bowling Green first half, I get it. But Penn State, in pretty much every other game, has looked rock solid on the defensive side. They beat Illinois convincingly. They harassed Luke Altmyer in the process. So I think that's a really good win, and that's what will bolster the resume, at least at this point, for Penn State. They'll have a big opportunity coming up this weekend when they play against USC. Oregon sits at number four. This is where I go a little bit off the eye test because they really haven't beaten anybody. And that's no disrespect to UCLA. That's no disrespect to Boise. Uh, that's no disrespect to Michigan State. It just, I don't know about Oregon just yet. 
But guess what? I'm going to find out about them this week. Ohio State comes to town, and if they play up to Ohio State, even in defeat, if it's an all-time classic, it's going to feel a lot like the Bama-Georgia game from a week ago, where, yes, Georgia dropped, but they didn't drop much. They dropped a little bit because you still came away respecting Georgia and acknowledging that Georgia's not a team you want to play. That could happen with Oregon this week. So they haven't really played anybody, and they don't have the resume to justify number four ranking, but I still think they're pretty good, and they're not a team I want to play right now. But Ohio State will get them this week. We'll learn all we need to know about those two teams. Let's go to number five. Alabama is at number five. People will say they lost to Vandy. I understand. It's a bad loss. It's a concerning performance. Defensively, they have significant issues. No one's pushing back on that. But they beat Georgia. They beat Georgia. So I have to give them credit for that. I have to acknowledge that that's a big-time win. And as of this moment... Just making sure, looking at the rankings, according to both the coaches and according to the AP, Georgia is the top one loss team, which translates to Alabama has the best win of the season. If you beat the top one loss team, then you have the best win of the season. I feel like it's pretty simple. Georgia then comes in at number six. They beat Clemson. Clemson's a team I have a ton of respect for. They didn't just beat them, by the way. They beat them convincingly and played really well in the second half of that football game. So I have Georgia sitting at number six. At number seven, it's the Miami Hurricanes. They haven't really beaten anybody. Now, when you look at the schedule going to Florida, that's a solid win. It's a solid win. Who knows what's going to happen with Florida as we move forward in the season, but that's still a solid performance. They went to Cal. I think Cal's solid. Miami, though, at this point, still a little bit of an unknown as far as strength of record is concerned. Now, as you guys have watched, I love what they're capable of, but the close calls do have my antenna raised just a little bit. They're undefeated, but a play or two here and there, and this thing could have looked very, very different. So right now I have them at seven in full control of their own destiny, but there are some question marks that I now have about the team that I've long favored in the ACC. At number eight, I have Tennessee. Now, Tennessee just beat Oklahoma a couple weeks ago. I still think Oklahoma is a solid football team. They're ranked in the top 20 as of this moment. I don't know if that will sustain, kind of like what we just talked about with Texas, who beat Michigan. Will that Michigan game still hold up when we fast forward to the end of the year and Michigan's lost a few more. If they lose a few more, will it hold up? That might be the case for Tennessee's win against Oklahoma, but as of this moment, still a rock solid performance. At number nine, I have BYU, a little different than most people. I look at the resume and with the win against both SMU and Kansas State, those two teams currently are very, very, very solid. Kansas State sits in the top 20. SMU has now cracked the top 25. They have beaten two ranked opponents, and they did so in pretty remarkable fashion. The win against Kansas State, yes, they were outgained, but they dominated at times the line of scrimmage, forced a lot of mistakes, and they made SMU look really human. There a couple weeks ago, BYU sitting there undefeated. I think they are really underrated right now when you look at the AP poll. Notre Dame sits at number 10. I understand that they have a terrible loss. I get it. The NIU loss is a tough one to wrap your head around. And clearly for a lot of you guys that are commenting on these videos, you acknowledge that that NIU loss is brutal. I get it. People saying the list lacks any credibility by having Notre Dame in it. Well, who are you going to have in front of them? (laughs) That's my question. Who should be in front of Notre Dame based on what they've accomplished this year? Because Notre Dame, while losing to NIU, also beat Texas A&M. And I'm not sure there's anybody that benefited more from Texas A&M's performance this past weekend. Notre Dame went and handled A&M in their own building. A&M is currently ranked in the top 15, meaning Notre Dame has one of the best wins in the country. And they did it on the road in a hostile environment. Notre Dame sits at number 10. At number 11, Clemson. Clemson hasn't beaten anybody. They haven't, but they sure look good, don't they? 
<laughs> they sure look like a team you would not want to play right now. At number 12, Ole Miss. Haven't beaten anybody. Their best win so far is against South Carolina. And at this point, I don't know how good South Carolina is, but they went and they won that game rather convincingly. Iowa State is sitting at number 13. Iowa State does have a solid win against Iowa. I got to give them credit for that. I think Iowa is pretty human. Had they beaten Iowa the way Ohio State beat Iowa, I'd feel a little differently about that victory. They didn't. They got by just ever so slightly, and they are undefeated. But at this point, Iowa State has to show me just the tiniest bit more to go join the likes of BYU and Miami and some of the other undefeateds that currently reside in my top 10. At number 14, I have Texas A&M. It wasn't so much that they beat Missouri, and you could say Missouri is a paper tiger. I'm fine with that. I won't push back on it whatsoever. I kind of agree with it, if I'm going to be honest with you. But it was the way they beat Missouri, the way they ran the football, how efficient that offense looked with Connor Wigman at quarterback, his accuracy that was on display. I thought he looked great in his return to the starting lineup, and it clearly caught Missouri off guard. So Texas A&M in at number 14. LSU is at 15. LSU hasn't really beaten anybody. Their best win, not all that unlike Ole Miss, was against South Carolina, and it was far less convincing than South Carolina, than Ole Miss's victory against the Gamecocks. And then at number 16, welcome to the Sweet 16, Indiana. Indiana's won every game by at least 14 points, all right? They have scored at least 40 in each of their last four games, but their best win at the moment right now is against a Maryland team that might barely get the bowl eligible. So Indiana, one of the best stories in the sport, couldn't be more excited about what I've seen from their quarterback, couldn't be more excited about what I've seen from their team. But at this point, it's difficult for me to 100% justify them being up there in the top 10 along some, alongside some of those teams that have been a little bit more battle-tested. That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. We really appreciate you guys being with us here this week. It's week seven. The season is flying by, but we're starting to learn a little bit more. And what a week we have coming up this week. We have a lot of games that we are so excited about, games that have been circled for months. The debut of the Red River rivalry in the SEC, Ole Miss and LSU, Penn State and USC, and the big one, Ohio State at Oregon. So, so many games to look forward to this weekend. There's a bunch of other games, by the way, that are super intriguing that we will make sure we preview on Thursday's show. So keep it locked in here at Always College Football. As always, like, rate, subscribe to the show wherever you get your show. And for those of you that are here with us via the ESPN College Football YouTube channel, hit that thumbs up button. We appreciate you. Tell your friends as well. For all of us here at ACF, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have an awesome day. And remember, it's always college football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.